have with me Coach Dean on my right and Coach Shannon on my left. One of them I like, one of them I don't. Which one is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I love them both. <laughs> love me. Yeah, I, uh, I picked Shannon, sorry Dean. And I, I do love you, I just don't like you all the time. <laughs> so today is Shannon's second appearance on the podcast. Mm. It's good to have you back. Good to be back. We are recording this right at the beginning of 2020. So we had a pretty crazy New Year's Eve, didn't we guys? Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> we went to Falls Festival in Byron Bay and partied. We hope you all had a great New Year's too. But uh, for those of you that haven't listened to episode two, which is Shannon's first appearance on the podcast, uh, Shannon is a Flex Success coach. Mm-hmm. Uh, Coming up on almost one year anniversary soon. Oh, on the team, yeah. yeah it's it's when it is. Yeah. It's January, though. We've nearly been in this polyamorous relationship now. <laughs> which <laughs> the best year of your life. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say, you going to say your life. <laughs> do I need to give you a rose on our one year anniversary of being mm-hmm. colleagues? Okay. I think so. All right, we'll do. <laughs> um, now, Dean, why are we here today? Because we want to talk to Shannon about stuff that she knows lots about. She's going to teach us how to be less <laughs> shit. <laughs> so what are we shit at, Shannon? And how can we teach our audience to be less shit at it? Well, do you want me to be honest? <laughs> <laughs> yes, brutal honesty. Um, I don't know. What, what do you, would you like to teach your audience about today? There well, are there are many things, aren't there? <laughs> mm. Well, you know, this time of year, we find that lots of people are reaching out to us, freaking out about the weight that they've gained, not sure how to lose it. But one huge issue or hurdle that people usually stumble across is once they reach it, they don't know how to keep that weight off. So maybe we can talk about that. How could they avoid the weight gain in the first place? How can they lose it? And how can they make sure that they keep it forever? Because unless you're getting on stage for a bodybuilding show, Mm -hmm. nobody's goal is to lose weight, keep that weight off for one day and then pile it back on again, you know? So um, I think that's a really important target or or message to hit home to people. I think it's a really good time of year to talk about that as well, because we know that in general, over the festive season, people do gain weight and you see that they don't actually end up losing it. So Mm. out of the entire year, this period is where the most weight gain occurs and it's not lost either. And I think it's partly because people are out of their routine. So most people aren't working, they're in an abnormal food environment, you know, everything's like maximized, there's loads of food available and people just let their habits slip. And I think all the one drinking day, that yeah, comes along with it. Well, it's not just one day either. Like it's yeah, good enough to say, oh, just enjoy yourself on Christmas Day. But then there's the next day, and then there's New Year's yeah. Eve, and then there's all the rest of it, work yeah. parties, and yeah. it just doesn't end. Um, mm. So I think yeah, talking about how to kind of control your environment um, and form you know good habits that are going to help you to lose the weight and then keep it off long term. Mm-hmm. That's quite a relevant topic at the moment. Yeah, in I think it was chapter five in the book. Uh, we expanded on context dependent repetition Mm -hmm. and discussing how willpower isn't something that we should you know use by itself in order to stay on track but rather through context dependent repetition we build habits so that it becomes the automatic response Mm -hmm. instead of the automatic response to be missing a training session eating tim tams instead of you know your protein and veg or whatever is on the plan Um, that's just automatically what you go to so maybe we can expand on, on that a little bit and start there. Yeah, so I think forming strong, like beneficial habits is a really good place to start. And you can take it a step back and kind of look at what you're doing now. And is that serving whatever goal you're looking to achieve? So I'd say, you know, everyone has favorable habits and non-favorable habits. And it's up to you to kind of have a look at your day-to-day life because we know that change takes time as well. Um, so you don't want to be taxing your willpower every single day for mm-hmm. a long period of time because at some point it's going to be really difficult to continue to do that. So if you've got strong habits in place, then it's like you say, it's kind of automatic. So looking at what you're currently doing, if you're really inactive, how can you change that? You know, perhaps you think that you could go to the gym after work. So it's like, right, as soon as I get in the car, I'm going to put on this playlist. That's going to be my cue. I'm going to drive to the gym and I'm going to train. Or if it's eating, um, you know, maybe your breakfast lets you down or something like that. So look at what you're currently eating and then try and form a cue and a habit as a response to that. 
Um, so I think that's probably the, one of the, the biggest things is to look at what you're currently doing. Don't try and change everything at once mm-hmm. because, again, I think people are kind of all or nothing. Mm-hmm. It leads back to the festive season. It's like, oh, okay, I've had one chocolate. Oh, fuck, that's the whole day mm-hmm. gone. Like, ruined everything. I mean, <laughs> I'll just continue now for the rest of the week. Somehow oh, these... I'll wait till New Year's. <laughs> oh, oh, shit. But I, you know, let yeah. it go far further than what I thought. Mm. Um, so, again, I think this is where the habit has come into place because even if one thing slips, it's like, right, that's okay, mm. because the rest of my day I've got that mail really late. Totally. Yeah. I like to tell my clients to go for the lowest hanging fruits mm-hmm. um, and to try and work these habits into their lifestyle instead of entirely like flipping their lifestyle on its head, mm. which can just be overwhelming and unsustainable. So, as an example, hi, Laura, my client, Laura, <laughs> she's very busy. Um, she runs a team of over 50 people, she's the director of the company. And some of my clients say to me, oh, Lizzie, I just don't have time to go for a walk. (coughs) Bullshit. Like, they do. But Laura legitimately is a very busy human. Um, So what she does now is she goes for, she does her meetings on the phone um, while she walks. Mm -hmm. So she walks around the block while she's chatting. She can't do that for all meetings, but where she can, that's what she does. And that way... She's not actually uh, adding any time pressures to her day, Mm. but she's getting some vitamin D, some sunlight, she's getting some fresh air. She's not staring at a screen for the time that she's walking because she's just got her earphones in. Mm -hmm. Um, So she's just found a way to create a new habit that really works for her lifestyle. Yeah, I find it a lot easier to have a conversation when I'm not standing still too. Yeah. It's almost like I need the, um, the external cues to drive some form of creativity, whether that creativity is coming from uh, thinking about ways to problem solve or just coming up with new ideas. Walking is the bump. You are a terrible multitasker, though. It's true. <laughs> it's true. I'm, de- I'm definitely that way inclined. Not great. Um, one thing, so uh, I'll throw this question to you, Shannon. We obviously have big on habit stacking, which is what you're talking about before, potentially, with people who are having cues to drive and all the rest of it. At this time of year, everybody removes themselves from their standard nine to five lifestyle. Do we want to try and encourage the same uh, time frame to be, or the same uh, habits to be associated with their holiday timing or should they shift it to a time that's maybe better suited knowing that they may have festivities when they otherwise would be at work? I think, yeah, I kind of get what you're going at. I think when you, you're you out of your routine, I think if you can maintain a new routine by forming different habits, like habit stacking, for example, I don't know, you're going to um, have breakfast and then go to the gym. Like That could be your two things that you're going to stack. Um, I think that's fine to change it up, even when you're, you know that you may not be able to continue that when you go to work, because it's good to have habits, but I think we also want to promote some kind of flexibility as well. Mm. Because if you're trying to keep it the same as, you know, when you're always going to work, what happens when you have holidays and time off, you know? Like, you should be able to kind of be flexible and adaptable, and I think that's something that a lot of people miss out on as well. And again, it comes back to the all or nothing thing, because if you're not able to be flexible and adapt, it's difficult to see other alternatives. Yeah. So you can use these tips to, keep yourself going and maintain these habits even when your environment and your you know everything's changed Mm. and what what do you think about that yeah i think that's a really good maybe harm minimization strategy as well Mm. because let's say somebody trains five days a week or you know has this particular eating schedule they go on holidays and they might not have access to a gym or just don't want to train that often on holidays which is fine or they don't have access to a kitchen or whatever the, the whole idea of, oh, well, I can't be perfect, so I won't do nothing is terrible because then we don't train at all and we just become a fat blob. We just eat chocolate and our health suffers, our, our concentration, our energy, everything. The um, um, financial analogy you gave the other day. Yeah. Ah, right. So, yeah, so I'll, I'll work that in for sure. So with harm minimization, my, my point here is maybe if you can't go to the gym five days a week, just go three. At least then you're maintaining what you've got, your strength and fitness. You're not going backwards. And that's a great place to be when you're on holidays or over Christmas or whatever it is. And same with food. If you can't eat to or you don't want to eat to exactly the same schedule, figure out the things that are easy for you to do and then work in, you know, an extra dessert here or whatever it is. So just reducing the harm that you're creating will put you back on on a good foot when you get back home. So there's not as much to fix. So with the financial uh, example, I think I said to you, Shannon, if I remember correctly, it was a passing comment in the kitchen, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, that... If you had a budget. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We find it interesting that people are like, oh, well, I've eaten a chocolate. Screw it. The whole week's out the window. But you wouldn't give yourself a $100 budget at the shops. You spend $105, right? So you've spent $5 over your budget. Or you've mm-hmm. eaten 
200 calories more than you should. You don't go, fuck it, I'm gonna sell my house and just like exactly, <laughs> I'm gonna spend everything I have, it's like raining dollar bills. No, you would say, oh well, I spent five dollars extra, maybe I won't buy my coffee out tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. And you would kind of make up for it or just pop the five bucks on the chin. But for some reason, people don't have that same attitude towards nutrition. It's just, mm. blows my mind. I think because finances have an immediate impact on your potential life quality. Uh, the, the next day, so you're you're, you're there. Whereas people uh, don't have the the foresight to look into the future and see how much their health is going to impact them at the back end. Yeah, perhaps as so. well. It's easier to think about like because uh, finances are there in hard numbers, mm. but mm. some people don't understand the numbers correctly, and we don't have not always have the numbers written down on paper. Mm. So it's easier to accidentally on purpose forget about. Yeah. Mm. So I, um, I posed the question to you, Shannon, and it, thought, it pro provoked a thought for me. And I think a good way to uh, promote this time of year would be to have behavioural rigidity, mm -hmm. despite the fact that you may have lifestyle flexibility. Mm -hmm. So maintain the behaviours, but just flip it and mm -hmm. be flexible when you actually implement that behaviour. Because it does seem to be that people just flip the script mm -hmm. and just go, oh, I don't know what to do anymore. It's like it becomes too hard. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I can't think... I think that's probably the best message we could probably give people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think having knowing what's important, so what are the foundations? So okay, I'm gonna train, you know, at least three times to maintain what I've got now. If I can do four or five, then reasonably like I will do that if I can. Um, and same with food choices, like again, if you can eat protein in every meal and if you can get your fruits and veggies in, you know, there's no harm in having a little dessert at Christmas, mm -hmm. you know, whatever you fancy. It's like people have that dessert and then they think, well, what's the point in doing any of the other stuff? <laughs> well, yeah. I've spent five dollars over my budget. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was at uh, the supermarket the other day, and so Dean and I live on the Gold Coast, which is a place where a lot of people come for holidays. So I was in the supermarket, and there was uh, two girls and a guy with a shopping trolley, and they were like, oh, they were talking about how excited they were for the start of their holiday, and they were looking at barbecue sauce, and oh no, sorry, it was mayonnaise. And they were saying, oh, which one should we get? And they were deciding, and they're like, oh, fuck it, we're on holidays. We don't need to get the low-fat one. Let's just get... I was like, so what if you're on holidays, dude? That means you're going to be eating out more, probably drinking more, training less. Even more reason to get the yeah. low-fat mayonnaise. Yeah. yeah. They were already overweight, by the way. So it's not like they had an awesome grasp on their weight management uh, when they aren't on holidays anyways. Mm -hmm. So it was just sort of just... Well, again, it's it's really inverted that, yeah. mentality. Mm. <laughs> they're, they're disregarding the behaviours that they potentially started to implement while in a more of a rigid life yeah. with nine to five jobs and all the rest of it. I know I'm typecasting with the nine to five, but <laughs> it's for obviously for people know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And yeah, they just throw caution to the wind and go, that'll do. Yeah. Instead of understanding this sort of the law of averages, like you said, like if you eat a little bit more over Christmas, it's, it's fine. The law of average is going to tell you that it's going to work out. So long as you just get back on the horse and continue with the mm. same behaviours you've had for the last four weeks, mm. four months, or four years. Yeah. Mm. So what tips would you have, Shannon, for somebody who is away on holidays or even in their normal day-to-day -day routine that feel like they're doing the right things but are really struggling with their hunger and, and that might be their downfall and that's why they're over it because they're really dealing with mm. hunger all the mm -hmm. time? I think um, you got to remember like all of the reasons why we eat. So firstly, being able to distinguish between, you know, physical hunger mm. and then psychological hunger because you may feel like eating appetite. but not actually be hungry yeah yeah so hunger and appetite um, and then if you're truly hungry choosing is looking at your food choices um, and maybe even the way you distribute your like calorie intake throughout the day as well mm. if you're someone who is hungry in the morning then it's probably a good idea to eat breakfast if you're someone who's not particularly hungry in the morning but prefers to eat more in the evening then maybe distribute your calories that way um, then looking at food choices in particular, so you want to go for foods that are more satiating and these are foods that have uh, usually like a high fibre content, um, maybe even like water, so things like your fruits and veggies will be low energy density which just means that they don't contain that many calories for the volume, so you can eat a larger portion mm -hmm. for fewer calories and obviously when you're trying to lose weight or manage your weight, your calorie intake is going to be important. Mm -hmm. So I just recommend including, firstly including a lean source of protein with each meal, because um, that will help to keep you full as well. And then filling your plate with fruits and vegetables. So at least over the course of the day, trying to get two pieces of fruit in or two servings of fruit in, and around five servings of vegetables minimum per mm -hmm. day. 
Um, and yeah, foods that are high in fiber, so for your carbohydrates as well. I think people often neglect carbohydrates, thinking that they're you know, carbs are bad. Yeah, carbs yeah. are bad. Carbs can make the gain weight, but things like potatoes, oats, um, even rice or couscous, something like that. They're going to contain fiber, which will help to keep you full. Because I think sometimes, even if you're getting fruits and veggies in, if you're not eating any carbs, you may still struggle to get enough mm -hmm. fiber in. Um, so doing that, and then you can also, I'd say it's kind of tight in with hunger, you can manage your appetite as well by including, including some foods that are, you know, tasty, just mm -hmm. tasty, but in smaller portions. Mm -hmm. So if you're someone who um, has huge appetite, and is struggling because you're restricting and then you feel like you're going overboard, um, including small portions of what you like. So if you're someone who doesn't do too well with um, willpower, that we mentioned earlier, rather than buying a block of chocolate and leaving it in the fridge, just buy like single serve, small like bar. Like a caramel or koala yeah. or something. And don't keep it in the house because again, managing your environment is gonna be really important for yeah. managing hunger as well. Mm. I think that's something that people don't always make that connection is because again, we don't just eat when we're hungry. We, the sight of food can trigger you to mm. want eating. Mm. You know? um, and minimizing hyper powerful food, so I did just say that you can satisfy your appetite, but keeping it to a minimum, or actually I think find it far easier. So we're all about promoting flexibility but it's actually sometimes just makes life easier to keep those things to a minimum mm -hmm. because they don't act on the brain in the same way as fruits and vegetables, mm. you know? Like it's very hard to overeat on broccoli yes. or potatoes unless you start adding <laughs> butter and salt. And that's because yeah. they're not as delicious. They're not in the category of hyper palatable foods mm -hmm. or palatable, however we want to pronounce I do like palatable. it. Which is the perfect combination of carbs and, and fats. We it's actually, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We unraveled that in a research, a flexi test research review. Yes. Do you remember what number it was? I don't remember the number, but it was um, something about combining um, carbohydrates on, on fat and fat on yeah. food rewards. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. What it does like in mm. the brain because again, I don't think many people know that appetite regulation like is controlled by the brain, which is why exposure to food cues and things yeah. like that do influence how Absolutely. you feel and what mm. you want to eat. On the topic of food cues, I'm a self-confessed chocoholic. And um, so like, you know, during a particular week of the month, mm -hmm. I just want to eat chocolate all day long. So what I do is I have a, a little tray of, you know, biscuits and chocolates in the fridge. And when I'm feeling like it's really hard for me to, for, to practice portion control, I'll just uh, push that tray to the back of the shelf and put some food in front of it. So when I open That's the fridge, I can't find it. <laughs> so when I open That's the fridge, my key to know. It's, it's not the, um, oh, you'll know from my food. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So when I open the fridge, it's not the first thing I see. Instead, I'm seeing like, you know, a big mango or a tub of Greek yogurt or something mm -hmm. like that. And I'm not triggered straight away. But if anyone wants to look into that a little bit more, search um, the hedonic staircase of dieting by, it's Dr. Mike Isratel from yeah, Renaissance Periodization that talks about it. And essentially he's saying that, if you know you're eating in a calorie surplus and you're full all the time, it you know you could afford or it might actually be beneficial to choose uh, high calorie dense foods that are really tasty to help you get all the food in, and you're not going to be struggling with, or likely not going to be struggling with appetite. Mm -hmm. But if you're dieting and your calories are low, your hunger and your appetite are high, it's better that you choose foods that aren't so tasty. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe not even herbing and salting your rice. You want that to be a little bit more bland so that when you finish the meal, you're not on edge, like looking for more and more. You're kind mm. of satisfied with the meal you mm. have. So that's the hedonic staircase of, of dieting that might be helpful. Yeah. And he also mentions um, to do with that, about how you eat your food as well. Mm -hmm. So when you're trying to get a lot of food in, eat quickly because mm. you'll be able to get more get in, in. Um, before feeling full. And then the opposite applies to those who are trying to manage their appetite. So, I think that kind of ties into being a bit more mindful when you're eating as well, which again, I don't think people tend to think about. A lot of people eat on the go, you know, they're rushing between jobs or, mm. you know, they don't have long for a lunch break, so they're just smashing the food in and then going, and then kind of feeling hungry after because it feels like you haven't even eaten anything, mm. you know? Or like when you miss the last bite, you're like, oh crap, I'm done. <laughs> I hate that. Yeah. Thing. <laughs> so I think taking your time to sit down and eat, even if it's 10 minutes, so I've had clients say to me, you know, I don't have time to eat lunch, like I'm mm. running between meetings. I'm like, 10 minutes, you know, everyone needs to pee, like that yeah. might be a couple of minutes. Are you like, suggesting that they eat on the toilet? <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. But like, you, you're entitled. That, actually, just 
Well, you only need one hand to hold it, don't you? Yeah, but I hold it. Depends on the container of rice, you know? Just... Just shove this only Chivani yogurt out of the tube. Just for the funnel. Mm. Yeah, just <laughs> Liquid lunch is only deep. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, like giving yourself at least 10 minutes to just sit down and eat. And then I'm sure you can spare 10 minutes somewhere else in the day. Like that's what I like to say. I'm sure you can make somewhere else, another part of the day more efficient by mm. 10 minutes to allow yourself to have lunch because yeah. that's important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so sitting down and not being on your phone whilst you're eating as uh -huh. well, taking your time to chew properly. Um, and that will actually help, I think, to manage hunger outside of just choosing better food choices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah. Um, again, you said something before that sparked uh, another thought, and that is that you should uh, satisf satisfy your hunger with low palatable, high volume foods mm. and satisfy your appetite potentially with palatable foods, provided mm. you have a good psychological grip on portion control. Yeah, yeah. shall we unwrap that a little bit? Yeah, so like I think, um, well, we're going back to this sort of the hedonic staircase of, uh, of, of dieting and finding hyperflatable foods when you want to eat more food and vice versa. When we look at physical hunger, we're primarily looking at a mechanical sort of feedback loop potentially from a sense of stomach fullness to shut down that hunger cue. And uh, I'll liken this to my preppers. Preppers are the contest prep for physique athletes, that is for anybody that's unaware of what I primarily do within the business. And that is people that are essentially starving themselves to get excessively lean in an unhealthy manner to a certain degree in order to get on stage for bodybuilding competition. And there reaches a point in time within a contest prep in which hunger is forever your friend. Yeah. He just walks beside you all day long mm -hmm. and never leaves you alone. Mm -hmm. He's the little cousin that you don't want to see at Christmas. You know? <laughs> and we see a lot of athletes get caught trying to stuff their stomachs full of food, mm. not recognizing that they're not actually hunger, they're not actually hungry, they just have a high drive for palatable, appetite-driven psychological mm. behavior. And I say to them, I could give you one kilo of cucumber, one kilo of broccoli, and one kilo of lettuce. You could eat three kilos of food if you could physically do it, and I bet you you would still want the donut. Yeah. And that's just because they're not recognizing the differentiation between appetite and hunger. Uh, the physical nature of it is we should get a stretching of the stomach if we take our time, if we chew our food more time, that allows more time. Um, I think there's even some really cool research that I, I have now haven't um, looked into for quite, quite a long time of um, if you double your chewing time, you'll, you'll have an immediate decrease in caloric intake across yeah, the course of the day. Yeah, increases all those things. Yeah, so it's super I think cool. that's how coach, Flex Success coach Alan now got such extreme chewing muscles. He has when the guy <laughs> eats, they're just like... He has monstrous He's got muscles. biceps on his face. <laughs> it's it's because he's done so many bodybuilding preps. He's just chewed and chewed and chewed. Yeah, so I think, um, <laughs> you know, when you know you're hungry, you've got that gurgly stomach, a little bit of hunger pains, or pangs, I think they're called people. Pangs. Um, then sit down, like you said, this is the same for anybody that's not even a contest prep. In the, the Christmas phase, the diet, the, sorry, the birthday phase, the whatever phase you want to use as an excuse to eat more food, is fill it up with lean protein, fill it up with vegetables, have some fruit on the side, take your time, chew tight, chew twice mm -hmm. as much as what you normally would, relax, get out of that sort of stressful state that you're normally in, and then just take some time and figure out whether or not you're actually now full or hungry. Mm -hmm. those, those feedback mechanisms should kick in relatively quickly. Yeah. yeah. Some people I find also confuse dehydration with hunger. Mm. So some of my clients are like, oh, I was just so hungry yesterday. I don't know what was up. And, you know, I'll have a look at what stage in their cycle they're in. And I, we can't figure out why they were so hungry. Maybe they didn't sleep properly. So we'll have a look into that. But then when, because our clients log everything, like how many breaths they take a day, <laughs> I, I look at um, how much water they drank. And I was like, oh, yesterday you drank about 40% less. Tomorrow, make sure you hit your minimum water target and see how you go. Lo and behold, oh yeah, I didn't really think about food as much. It was easier for me to, to resist my cravings. So sometimes they can be confused as well. So that would be really important. Yeah. Um, Dean mentioned, and so did Shannon, filling your plate with fruits and veggies. And Shannon mentioned two fruit, five veg. What that means specifically, you know, like one grape isn't considered one piece of fruit. One serving of fruit is about 150 grams. So that would be one and a half bananas is about 150 grams. Mm -hmm. um, well, like a huge apple is about well, 150 probably grams. Probably one and a half apples on average. Yeah, for, for an average apple, one and a half. Um, but for frozen fruit, one serve is only 30 grams. For dry fruit. So what did I say? Frozen fruit. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't mean to say frozen fruit. I did mean to say dry fruit. Thanks for picking me up on that. If we were to eat 150 grams of dried fruit, that would be like half of my 
daily intake for carbohydrates. Well, it's five, yeah. five times five times fruit and veg, so too, it's huge. Yeah, so it's about seven hundred fifty grams of protein. Yeah, less satiating for all the reasons mm-hmm. that we mentioned that these other foods are satiating. Like it's very energy dense. Yeah, smaller portion. You know, because we're reducing water. the yeah. exactly the. Well, we're taking moisture and water. Yeah. Yeah, so that would be considered a low residue food because they're sucking the moisture out of it, but all of the calories still remain. Whereas a high residue food would be something like strawberries, uh, where there's lots of moisture. So that strawberries are what, 4% carbohydrates? Mm. Dried fruit is what, like 60% carbohydrates? So vastly different. Yeah, like if there was a God, God created strawberries. <laughs> Just a thank you, God. <laughs> a <laughs> but, prepper's best friend. But this comes back to this sort of, um, uh, the grocery aisle situation again. Yeah. Is the cool thing about having a little bit of an understanding around what's in food, where it comes mm-hmm. from, is you can start to pick and choose to maintain behaviors without having to think about it. Yeah. Like you said, like this caution to the wind concept, I'm on holidays, don't worry about it. It should be flipped exactly the same. It's like I now have the opportunity to have lots more, a lot more food. That was going to be awesome English, lots more food. <laughs> a lot more food should I want it, you know? Yeah. So like if we are uh, somebody who's eating a ton of calories, struggling with hunger, highly inflatable foods, maybe go for dried fruit instead of fresh fruit. Mm-hmm. You know, at least yeah. one portion throughout the week. Vice versa, if you're not on the holidays, if you really like bananas but you're not traveling over the holidays, maybe just eat strawberries instead. Like, let's flip some of our uh, choices but maintain the same behaviors. Yeah, yeah. reason being Dean suggests that is because bananas is 20% carbs, whereas strawberries are four. That was why you suggested mm-hmm. that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so with we mentioned what a serving size of fruit is 30 for dried, 150 for fresh or frozen, or 125 mils of 100% fruit juice. We want two serves of those a day. Whereas for vegetables, 75 grams of non-starchy vegetables is considered a serve. Mm -hmm. So five serves of 75, you know, almost 400 grams. So we want at least, but that doesn't mean that, you know, if you eat 500 grams of vegetables and 400 grams of fruit, that there's a problem. There's not. They're your minimum intake uh, for vitamin and minerals purposes, as well as fiber, as well as satiation. But we also have to remember that... um, Fruit and vegetables are mainly water-soluble vitamins, meaning our body doesn't store them. We excrete what we don't need, um, all you know, pretty immediately. So if we eat fruit and veg on Monday, but we don't eat them on Tuesday, Tuesday we're not getting what we need. Um, but that same does not apply for fat-soluble vitamins. Mm-hmm. We can think like nuts, avocados, seeds, salmon, things like that. Those are stored in the body, so we can eat more on Monday and less on Tuesday, and we're still okay there's a storage system so really fruit and veg for, for many reasons need to be a daily habit yeah and having said that doesn't mean you have to eat the same fruits and vegetables no every single day. or in the same way yeah mm. um so something that we mentioned in the book is that you have these foundational habits but then you can be flexible within those the same goes for your protein choices we don't just have to have chicken all the time um and i think it's good when you you're aware of all the options available and you can kind of see how that fits into your habits so like you mentioned over the festive season if you're someone who likes consuming, you know, like bananas and mangoes, well, if you know that you're going to have some more energy dense foods, then you may swap your fruit options to apples and strawberries. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just a, it's an easy win to just save some calories for other things. Yeah. Um, but you're still getting in your, you know, fruit and veg. yeah, your fruit and veg, yeah. and your, you've got those habits in place. And I think that's really important to have those habits when things change. So obviously, I move around a lot, and I'm in different environments a lot of the time. And going into a, a completely different supermarket in a different country with different things available, um, it can be, if you don't know what you're doing, it can be kind of overwhelming. Mm-hmm. You may not know where to start. Whereas I know, right, I've got to get some fruit and veg, so I'll just see what's here. Yeah. You know, grab two different options of fruit, grab a bunch of veg, it's like, okay, now I'm going to look for a protein source. You know, mm-hmm. I'll usually go for whatever is looks like I know what yeah. it is. <laughs> oh, that's like chicken, that'll do. <laughs> you know, not sure what part, but that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Um, so once you know how to structure your eating, like you can be pretty flexible within that and mm. you know, add on things or take away things depending on what you think your day is going to look like. Mm. So yeah, I think that's just I mean, The biggest thing for me in this too, especially in the festive season, is that when you maintain these behaviours, especially when you travel, I find it makes the, uh, the process of eating something different mm. or, or the process of eating with families and friends far more enjoyable because it literally goes to the guilt-free part Mm -hmm. because you're like, I'm making good decisions, I have good behaviours, I'm likely restricting calories through these behaviours, Mm -hmm. and now I can eat this without really having too much concern because even if I am two, three hundred calories over my limit, 
law of average, it's going to be sweet. Yeah. Like I'm yeah. not going to gain much fat. Yeah, so totally. It's quite liberating to be somewhat uh, restrained in your behavior. Because mm. yeah. if you're eating delicious food for every single meal eating out, it's not a novelty anymore. No. It's not yeah. a treat. It's your lifestyle. But actually, what Shannon, what you were describing before about, you know, pick a fruit, pick a veg, pick a lean source of protein. Shannon and I, listeners, are working on something called... This is a, the, the preview, isn't it? The first time mm. we've announced it. Yeah, a foundation um, diet. A foundation diet, exactly. And later today, I'm going to record a video on exactly what a foundation diet is, why it's important, and how to, how to put one together. Um, and we're going to be putting together somewhat of a step-by-step -step course for mm. our one-on-one -on -one clients mm. who think that they, not everyone would benefit from it, like some people who are... Well, everyone would benefit from, from yeah, a foundation diet for sure. The main purpose but, of it is to put habit formation at the forefront of mm. what you're trying to do. Because a lot of people, when they start tracking, it's like, right, well, I can kind of see that I can have whatever I want within reason. Yeah. So I'll just have this, this, this. And then they get hyper-focused on the numbers. Like, oh, crap, I've got this to fit in for the rest of the day. Yeah. It's like, if you prioritize your food choices, like your macros will fall into place. Mm -hmm. You just really want to put the healthy habit formation at the forefront because it's so important for these reasons, yeah, like weight absolutely. maintenance and being adaptable and flexible, mm -hmm. which is, yeah, it's really good. The only that. clients that we won't put through this process would be the ones that we've already worked with and have mm. those habits established is really it. So uh, by the time this podcast comes out, maybe the video on foundation diets will be released as well. So if you want to know more about foundation diets, just search that on YouTube or podcast we'll channel. Put the link in the show notes. Yeah, we'll put the link in the show notes as soon as it gets released. In the, the description box if this is being watched on YouTube <laughs> as well. There's too many platforms to keep up with now. Right. <laughs> We're everywhere, world domination. <laughs> now, just to wrap it up, Maybe we should talk about what happens if somebody does stuff up. Um, you know, maybe they just can't resist that block of chocolate and they know that they didn't practice portion control. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the difference between lapse and relapse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. So there is a huge difference between a lapse, which is kind of a momentary slip up in the habits that you're trying to establish, mm -hmm. and a relapse, which is when that one lapse happens again and again and again and you just slide back into where you started mm -hmm. I think having a little bit of self-compassion goes a long way so knowing that okay I'm trying my best change takes time if you've got really deeply ingrained old habits you know and you're trying to change a lot of things at once it can be quite difficult mm -hmm. so just I think hold yourself to a standard but also know that you if you as long as you're trying your best then you know forgive yourself and move on and kind of look at the situation and see what you could have done better and then apply mm -hmm. that for the next time it happens so just learn from it I think if you keep repeating the same mistake and you're not learning anything then you need to reflect a little bit harder uh -huh. and you know think about how you can implement the change that will help you mm -hmm. um yeah so just to see where you've gone wrong and then what you would do differently next time I think that will help you to just keep that lapse as a lapse and not relapse, relapse. into old behaviors because we're very much after progress not perfection right which is something uh, you and I mm. drive home to our clients. Dean requires perfection as a prep coach. Because <laughs> yeah. there's not well, much room for error. Close to. <laughs> like even, even for me, it's like you, you need to get like within, I suppose, the, I have ranges, I suppose, of yeah. expectation, even for prep clients when it comes and to And that range will change adherence. closer to stage day. Yeah, like, you know, nece nece the necessity for your accuracy is going to go up the closer you get, especially the more body fat you lose, it goes up because then the percentage of impact a, a lapse has on mm. the, the week is larger because there's less room for error and all the rest of it. But mm. for general pop and sort of day-to-day -day dieting, I mean, even if you looked at it mathematically, even if you ate over a thousand calories, the worst case scenario, if every little bit of it stored as fat as 100 grams mm. across the entire body. I don't, I'm hesitant to show how much flexibility we can really have because I think people won't take themselves or the process as seriously though. Well, yeah, the big, but the biggest issue is because it's only small, it's actually counterproductive to you being accurate mm. because mm. then what happens is you have an individual that goes, ah, I probably only gained up to 100 grams of fat, that's cool. And they do it again and again and again and again and again. And before you realize that 100 grams has become Accumulation 10 kilos, over time. Maybe not 10, even a couple of kilos, it's made a significant difference to the individual. So I think knowing the fact, knowing that even though the, the, the lapse is small from a mathematical potential fat gain point of view, it's also liberating because it means you can forget about it and move yeah. back to good behaviors as opposed to excuse it and then use it as yeah. an excuse to continue. Yeah. I actually have a really good example of that biting someone in the ass pretty hard. Um, my American client, which I will not name, love her dearly. Um, she's the only female American client I have, so if you're listening to this, you know who you are. 
um, she lost a bunch of weight, was looking fantastic, and she, after that, she just kept making these mistakes that were out of character for her, and I asked her, like, what's going on, why is this happening, and she just said, she, she almost ended up, um, she, she put on a bunch of weight and, and took a few backward steps, and I, I just was having a chat to her, and she said that, well, you know, I just felt invincible, quote mm. unquote, because she had this, I'm not going to call it a binge, because she was in control, she knew what she was doing, but she was having these episodes of overeating, and then the scales didn't change significantly enough for her to change her behavior. She was like, oh, that was really fun, got away with and it. I got away with it, exactly, she felt invincible, so she did it again and again and again, and accumulation over time meant she stacked a bunch of weight on, but it happened so slowly that you know, she, she didn't see it happening and it mm. hit her like a, a truck. The same is she, she removed that behavioral rigidity. Yeah. Mm. She went back to old behaviors. Yeah. Not recognized that it was old behaviors that got her back to the same position that she's now in once she's uh -huh. got back to the original behaviors. Surprise, surprise. It was a real slippery slope mm. event. Yeah, it was challenging. Yeah. Um, now, oh, this I podcast. Just a couple of things. Oh, yes, go on. Yeah, just a couple of points that I wanted to um, touch on again. So something to do with the flexibility within the foundational habits, something that I like to say is to give yourself a wide path to follow, not a tightrope. Mm -hmm. They both lead forwards. So you've got options, and like you say, slow progress is still progress. And moving forwards is what you want to do. It doesn't matter if you're going at 100% or if you're going at 70%. Mm -hmm. you know? like I think trying to teach people the difference between like what they're doing and getting the most bang for your buck. So, you know, like you said, nailing the protein and the fruits and veggies, like that's gonna get you pretty far, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. And then finer details after that are the finer details. So that may take you from 80 to 100, but if you're still maintaining at 80, like moving forward at 80, despite other things going on, then that's a really great approach for you. So it's being aware of your options, so having that wide path, mm -hmm. you're still going forward, so not a tightrope that you're likely to fall off. You know? Yeah. Um, and then it's a great one metaphor. more thing. Yeah. Love that. One more thing to touch on that we mentioned managing hunger, and we briefly mentioned appetite. So when we're talking about hunger in terms of adherence, we've got to consider the other factors impacting adherence. So there's no point, you know, optimizing your strategy to um, satiate yourself and then ignoring all the other things that impact adherence. So like when you mentioned about when it's that time of the month and you've got cravings for chocolate that are you know, stronger than ever, so you push the chocolate to the back of the fridge to minimise the external cue, mm -hmm. but you've also got the option of eating the chocolate should you want to. And I do. Yeah, I exactly. just don't gorge There was actually a study um, looking at females um, and the menstrual cycle and those who during the time of the month allow themselves a 200 extra 200 extra calories every day of the week mm -hmm. and they were told that they could have chocolate those adhered better to the other women who were restricted from having chocolate so again it's just like yeah. knowing yourself and learning to manage hunger but also to manage appetite at mm -hmm. the same time because they're both going to ultimately impact adherence yeah mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and even a quick side shoot to that I, I also believe there's some good research in um there being a large cultural impact on the expectations of what you think you'll want to eat during that time of the month mm. as well. A lot of people, mm. I think, now talk about the chocolate thing, but that seems to be culture specific. Mm -hmm. So wherever you are, if you're listening to this, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the thing that you should crave, but rather that's mm -hmm. it's highly specific mm -hmm. to you and where you're from and the people you talk to. Well, can about. I just say, I'm very glad that I'm from here because chocolate is <laughs> freaking fantastic. <laughs> when I traveled to, was it Cambodia and Laos, they, chocolate just wasn't really a thing. They did mm. coconut treat. Did you, you've been there, haven't you, Southeast Asia? Um, not those particular places okay. in Southeast Asia. Right, so I remember like looking for chocolate, like, mm. my love, yeah. <laughs> I, we have not reunited in like a week. I peanut butter. <laughs> I think I went like two months about chocolate and peanut butter. No! When I went to a Western country, I was like, oh my God, I forgot about you. <laughs> I think it might be because it's so hot there all the time and yeah, aircon is lacking they just do coconut treats for that reason but yeah, like, I couldn't live there for that reason no. so it would be Sorry. an interesting thing that may they may actually crave a savory for example Maybe. whatever it may be it's yeah. something that they're sort of because i mean you you think about even even as a male in westernized culture girls or people still talk i still remember them as a young dude talking about the fact that oh if you're a female you're going to crave chocolate and ice cream and typical foods that you think about yeah uh, here whereas i'm sure if you were in southeast asia yeah. and I was that they're not they're like oh my god I'm just nice hanging, boring, yeah. hanging for a chocolate. It could yeah. be like, yeah, I can't wait to eat bread this week. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. I'm not sure. But uh, I would suspect, though, that whatever the food is, it would be hyper palatable. Of course. Yeah. So, a delicious food meaning something with you know fats and carbohydrates that are harder to resist and harder to portion control. That just happens to be chocolate here. It might be coconut trees mm. in Cambodia. Mm. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Slash 
shaved ice is shit. Unless it's coming, coconut milk, yeah. chocolate, and all that good stuff. Because the shaved ice was actually pretty damn good. In really? Well, it was shaved. I like milk. Chendol, but not shaved ice. Oh, we I thought, thought Chendol coconut. was. No, but Chendol is shaved ice. Yeah, but it's it has coconut stuff in it. Exactly, yeah, they exactly. Put stuff but on. if you had shaved ice, like in Hawaii, it's just like sugar. Yeah. Right. We had it. We had Chendol in Singapore on our honeymoon, mm. and then we had um, the shaved ice dessert in Japan. Remember? Yeah, it was made from milk, which was yeah. this particular yeah. brand. It was no. yum, like but I think it was yum because it had like cream and all this other stuff on it. No, but yeah, it was. It was. It was a dairy-based shaved yeah. ice, all those yeah. ice infused with milk. Yeah. It's fat. Milk, not actual milk, but milk this brand they cause, and they make really good ice cream from it too, mm -hmm. the Mr. Whippy ice cream. Mm -hmm. Fun times. Now, because our tagline is how to be less shit, mm -hmm. I feel like we've already given a good summary, but just to kind of boil it down to a couple of points, do you want to give us how to be less shit tip one, Yeah. two, and three? So whatever goal you're trying to achieve, form favorable habits. Mm -hmm. So look at what you're currently doing and if anything's moving you further away from your goal, target those ones first. Think about how you could change them. And um, you're looking for, like we mentioned, context uh, dependent repetition. Mm -hmm. and I think one thing we haven't really mentioned is allowing yourself a bit of reward to continue, like to keep that habit up. So mm -hmm. that once you're going to the gym, you kind of get an intrinsic reward from that anyway. So I think you don't have to necessarily seek out a reward. Um, but learning to see the positives in what you're doing, I think that's one strategy that you can um, use that to tie that in. Great. Tip two um, would be, in terms of managing your hunger, look for the low energy density foods that are high in fiber, um, which will be things like fruits and vegetables and protein as well, and then distributing your calorie intake in a way that's going to satisfy you. So, like I said, if you're hungry in the morning, eat then. If you like eating in the evening, maybe try into fasting, distribute your calories more so towards the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, number three, that lapse would be, relapse, maybe. yeah, like a lapse and, yeah, lapse and relapsing, um, knowing that slip up may be normal, giving yourself a wide path, not a narrow, uh, tight road. And yeah, I think those are pretty much the main points, but I think, you know, if you're doing those things, then you pretty much going to get where you want to be. Yeah. I think, yeah, having the ability to adapt to different environments is really important. Mm -hmm. So being mm -hmm. flexible within those habits. Yeah. They're great be less shit tips. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> now we're going to move on to our segments and we're going to start with something worth sharing. Okay. So I have got a book that I read recently. Uh -huh. Um, a slightly different read for me. This is Science as a Candle in the Dark by Carl Sagan. And it's basically about why we fall for pseudoscience. Okay. Um, and he looks at it as quite sci-fi-ish. He looks at it in terms of um, demons, witchcraft, UFOs. It's very interesting. Like why we believe in witchcraft. Yeah, and or why it. we believe in UFOs, like people who claim to have seen things. Things that believes like, in UFOs. Uh, well, maybe well, I don't know if he believes them, but rather he's extremely intrigued and interested by the potential for them to exist. Okay, mm. yeah. right. Yeah, no, it's a really, it's a really worthwhile read, and even about um, why like people have been abducted, like people who genuinely think that they've been abducted by mm. UFOs. Yeah. <laughs> but then like, they go through all of that. Yeah, it's really interesting. Okay, yeah, cool. cool. What made you choose that book in the first place? Uh, I bought it from a bookstore when I was in New York, and obviously I've heard of Carl Sagan and um, heard good things about just his work. The Demon Hunter. I think that topic sounds really interesting now that you've explained it, but I'm not sure if I would pick up a book called The Demon Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like he's the one that made it end up. <laughs> Maybe. Thank you for sharing, Shannon. Um, now we're changing the questions from the first 10 podcasts. Yeah. Your question now is... So this is a lightning round. We want quick, yeah, lightning round. Quick and fast. What's your favourite flavour of diet right? Now this is flex coach specific because we all seem to be we're diet right fanatics. Are, team, which is a flavour of, a type of cordial by the okay, way. That's everyone. apple we're team diet right. Apple and raspberry. Yeah, I think I like... We've got apple black currant, apple guava, we've got lime, we've got lemon, we've got fruit crush, tropical crush. Dean knows them all. Apple raspberry. Fruit cordial. We're after a sponsorship yeah. diet, right? If you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd have to say the fruit cordial. So it's like a little bit of everything. Okay. I'd like to commit to one thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really good. Says the girl who hops around the world all the time. Okay. Yes. Love it. Can't even um, cool. Now, <laughs> if you had Why'd to... Why'd you find? We can have me. Yeah, what can I lost us? <laughs> if you had to die tomorrow, how would it go down? And why would you choose that way? Okay, so I do I know that I'm gonna die tomorrow? Oh. Then the answer changes. Yeah. 
if I know that I'm gonna die, then it's you gotta go out with a bang. Okay, right. <laughs> what's that bang? Well, you think there's only one way to go out with a bang. You gotta have the world's greatest party. <laughs> okay, and how? What in that party would kill you? Well, <laughs> happiness. Many things. Extreme yes, happiness. happiness. <laughs> Euphoria. An extreme sense of euphoria that raises thy body temperature Are you trying far to say? beyond ne necessary temperature. You cook yourself from the inside out, and you just far beyond natural. You, you <laughs> lean back into life, and then it takes you away. Now, for yeah. those who can't take hints, I think what Shannon is saying is she would take so <laughs> many drugs that she would die. Is this is this where we're going? You're trying oh, to be right. subtle, and I've just like ripped off the something. Really? All right, uh, that's funny. <laughs> that that would be a fun way to go down. I'll I'll join that party. I reckon yeah. off the top I of the mountain die. on a sweet ripcord. But if anyone asks, I was spiked. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. <laughs> Shannon's mum's not listening. <laughs> now, uh, what is something that you think you're right about that you think is very controversial? That violet crumbles oh. <laughs> are better than crunchies. <laughs> that is controversial. <laughs> but it's right. <laughs> you heard it here first, guys. No, no comment. Yeah, we did a blind taste test on the crunchy versus violet when we went away for mm -hmm. a weekend away in Mullumbimby slash Nimbin slash Fire and Bay slash Moonball. Moonball, yeah. Um, we went a lot of places that weekend, didn't we? Yeah, Moonball was the best. That was a great fun. <laughs> the, the fires were so close that we woke up on Saturday morning and there was ash on my car. Mm. Mm. That was great fun. Um, but okay, well, you're wrong. But that's okay, <laughs> you can think you're right. I will say consistency of our crumble tick, flavour of the crunchy tick. <laughs> Okay, we're moving on to a would you rather. And for this year's Christmas, we hung out with a bunch of friends and Shannon got gifted this game, this card game called... Shitty Choices. Yeah, Shitty Choices. Let's read that out. No matter what you choose, you still lose. <laughs> <laughs> now, previously I was making up would you rather questions just from the magic creativity in my head. But now moving forward, I think we might use these cards. I'll pick mm -hmm. one at random. Yeah, yeah, Dean, awesome. do the honours. Shannon. Would you rather be forced to eat only very spicy food or only incredibly bland food? Oh, spicy. That's easy. So breakfast, spicy, dessert, spicy. Yeah. Yeah. What's a spicy dessert? It's a big red cinnamon cup. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you can eat. Chili mango. Does that count? Ooh, yeah. I like that. I had oh, a chili. What about chili mango sticky rice? Breakfast. Well, I just had dumplings, so I could definitely be spicy. For breakfast. Yeah, yeah. I dumplings in a banana protein shake. Now, shop. I just, I feel a little bit disappointed at that question. Yeah, but that's it is, that's the luck of the draw, though. There's oh, no, we can't no, do a second? Nope, that's oh, the luck of the draw. No. Shane's got away with murder. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, hopefully the next person gets like, would you rather eat your own poo? Or FYI, like, there are some bad ones in this. There are some shockers inside this We played this at Christmas. <laughs> There's some real bad ones. I feel like you got let off the hook yeah. real easy yeah, at that time. Woo! All right, well, thanks for appearing on the podcast once again, Shannon. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it was a great podcast that listeners can take away a lot from and be a bit less shit. Yeah. yeah. Now, we would normally also ask people where they can find you. However, oh. they already know they can find you on our website, which is awesome. But where will people see you next in the next ah, week, the next month, let's just say, if you're on change. Instagram stories? Because Shannon doesn't, she just travels the world. She's the nomad. She's the yeah, nomad. Yeah, she flex. doesn't really have a stable home. <laughs> Your stable home is on the interwebs with Flex Success, yes. isn't it? So where are people going to see you and what Okay, you? so next place is Melbourne, and then I've got Taipei and Amsterdam booked. Probably go to Dublin and then go home. And then after that... It's and home is? Nice. Home is UK, Essex, and could kind of go anywhere from there. I'm thinking Spain in April, Portugal, probably Croatia, Budapest at some point. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Great, that's a good Taiwan's list. Taiwan's the next hit list. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, no, well, Coach Allen place. lived there until he was, what, 17 or something? He was also born there, yes. Yeah, well, he was born and raised there until he was 17. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure we'll have some hot yeah, tips Yeah, we already messaged him. So, they don't have time to do, like, when you move around so much, like, I can't research these places. Yeah. I just need to go where it's cheap, where it's convenient, you yeah. know, where yeah. the good flights are. Totally. And like, Taipei was just one of them. So, I've already got, like, like, when I put it on Instagram, I always get people sending me, go to this place, do this, Oh, my God, this. no, like, he's cool. from Taiwan, not Taipei. Yeah, but Taipei is within Taiwan. Oh. Yeah. Awkward. This Oops, is that is awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, edit this out. <laughs> awesome. All right, Shannon. Thanks awesome. for listening, everyone. Cheers. Bye.